You know, as they were singing the song, they're going towards the, the, the end, you know, how great God is. Something that was coming to my mind was how, as we hear all the noise going on around us, sometimes it's easy to forget how great a God we serve. And as we hear so much going on, and as we hear so, so much trouble, and as we hear so many issues going on, and as we see our children being impacted and how much uh, sometimes we as, as parents, sometimes we see how little impact we're having in our children. I don't know how many of you parents sometimes see yourself as helpless as, as you see uh, the world just swallowing up our children. And, and then we see ourselves, our lives are so filled with so much work, with so much stuff, and we seem like sometimes that we just can't keep up with this world. How many of you have seen yourself confused about what you're going to do with your life? Where your life is going to be 10 years from now? What are you going to be doing? And in trying to, to figure out the best way to do it. And one day you think one thing, right? And then the next month you look back and you think something else. Amen. Have any of you gone through that? Amen. And you're thinking, which is the best way? Which is the best way for me to lead my life? Which is the best way for me to go? And we forget that we serve an almighty God who is in charge. Amen. That we serve an almighty God who really has a plan. And that's why today I entitled the sermon, by the way, God does have a plan. Amen. And the idea that us as human beings, as we think of the right thing to do, a lot of times the question is, is not, what should I do? A lot of times the question should be, what is God doing and how can I align myself to what God is doing. Where do I see myself with God? In this sermon of, of by the way, God has a plan, comes from a story that we've known for many years, but that we've sort of stayed away from. And we sort of don't go back and read it because we, we, we live in a time that, remember, sermons are supposed to be now today about motivation, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prosperity. Prosperity. How to get you fired up because people are so depressed. People are so taken up with things that you're supposed to get a, go to church, and, you know, and get a, a good, you know, speech <laughs> to get you going. And, and for about two weeks, I've been thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah. And as I, I thought about that, I said, what place does this have? You know, and, and, and as you begin to look at that, at that story, I said, you know, first of all, did this really happen? Is this something that had happened? And you begin to see the things that are in it. And I'm telling you, as I struggle the first week, I'm trying to find God here and I'm trying to, to, you know, to get fired up about the story. And I kept saying, I'm not going to give up on it because I know that there's a message in this Sodom and Gomorrah here today. And as I look back, one of the things that sticks out in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is two men, right? Lot. And Abraham. 
Lot and Abraham. One was so close to sin and the sin around him that he had to be rescued. The other one was so close to God that he was able to be used to save the one that was closest to sin. Now, they were both believers, weren't they? They both knew. So as we look at ourselves as Christians today, the question that came to my mind is, Juan, which one are you? Which one are you, Lot or Abraham? Are, are we so close to sin that we're going to have to be rescued from sin or are we so close to God that we can be used to rescue sinners? As we look at ourselves in our jobs, how do people see us? Because, you know, sometimes we want to be able to relate to people. Sometimes we want to get close to them. But how close are we and are we becoming like them? that we're going to have to be rescued? Mercy. Or do they see us as someone who can actually rescue them and give them salvation? When we go to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, I would like to take you to Genesis 13, 10 and 3. And, and there uh, we see... Where, where the story comes that Adam, I mean that Abraham and Lot, uh, both, they, they grew so much, they both had so much, you know that Lot was uh, Abraham's nephew, and, and they both came to Canaan, and they both grew so much that they had to separate, and, and in Genesis 13 says, and Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plains of, of, of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom, uh, like the garden of the Lord, like these lands of Egypt, as you go toward Zor. Then the Lord for himself, all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan and, and, and dwelt in the cities of the plain and, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So uh, uh, it seemed like Lot decided to go to, to what, what was the best. Abraham said, Lot, you, you go ahead and pick. And let me tell you something, people. Do you know that I have followed that principle for my whole life? That story, I remember since a child, Lot and Abraham. A lot of times, people, what looks good is not the best. A lot of times when you think you're getting the best, you know, uh, how many people have you seen? Uh, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to get a, I don't want to get a Toyota. I want to get, you know, a BMW, right? Until it breaks down, right? <laughs> then you wish you had a Toyota, right? <laughs> then you wish, then you wish you had a Toyota because you could go down there and get a Toyota part for, you know, $15, you know, and you can't get an ashtray for a BMW for less than $500, right? So a lot of times you might look at something and what looks good might not be all that good. So a lot of times be careful of what might be appealing to the eyes. And here I'm talking to you, you know, single men and women, you know, be careful of what's appealing to the eyes because Lot, he said, wow, look at all that green. Look at all this stuff. That's what I want. Abraham said, go ahead. You take that. I'll take the mountains over here. Because you see, Abraham knew that as long as God was with him, it didn't care if he had dirt and rocks. 
he could grow anything because anything was possible with God. So as we make choices today of, of what to do, where we go, uh, we need to put God in there first. You know, is, is God with me? Is, is God leading me? Because when you're with God, it doesn't matter what happens. You know, things are going to go good. Now, he went out there and um, he was able. There were five cities out there. And, and the thing is that as you study through, there are so many lessons to be learned to be learned from, from here. We have to move quickly. He moved to Sodom. Uh, there were five cities out there. there. There was Sodom. There was Gomorrah. There was Adma. There was Sebalim and Bela. And uh, and he went out there and it seems like he kept moving his tent closer and closer to Sodom. He kept get, be getting more attracted. You know, have you have you heard the the antidote, the story of of, uh, of the of the frog in the kettle? You ever heard that? Is you know how you burn a frog, right? You've heard that one, right? You put the frog in water in the kettle, right? In cold water, and she's fine. And you take the stove and you just turn it up little by little, right? And, and what happens is that the frog adapts. To its surrounding and you heat it up a little bit more and they adapt and you heat it up a little bit more and they adapt and pretty soon they actually burn alive and they don't even realize it and when I when I look at that I can see as we as human beings we adapt to sin and we're like this is okay well, you know, what are you going to do? You know, hey, you know what I mean? God understands. Right? God understands. Hey, you know, and, and, and pretty soon we start getting ourselves into these things. And, and this is what happens a lot. And we work ourselves into a position that when difficult times comes, we have to be rescued from sin. We, um, I don't know if you've been hearing about all these fish right around us here within 10 miles of us that are dying. And manatees. At beaches, just a little bit north of us where it's just, it's just thousands of fish on the, on, the, on the side dead. And it's from all of these uh, uh, insecticides that are being for the, for the sugarcane fields and the Everglades that are going into the Okeechobee Lake and they're, and they're going into the ocean now. And now there's, there's uh, miles and miles of beaches here in South Florida that you, you can't go to. Uh, and, you know, you hear of these shootings going on in school. I remember when the first shootings coming out, people were like, oh my God. All of a sudden, there's a shooting, and it's like, oh, is this it's another shooting? Next channel, oh, you got a movie? Let's watch a movie. We, we get used to stuff. When will there be a sign of the second coming of Jesus? Because it seems like none are. It seems like nothing is anymore a sign of the second coming of Jesus. Because we keep adapting to things. And we keep thinking that everything is part of life. And, and we somehow we keep waiting for this like big thing to happen. It, it, it's almost like you know, you know the, the little antidote too of the story of the guy that's drowning in the ocean, you know, and, 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 and a helicopter comes by and says, no, God's going to save me. <laughs> okay, helicopter leaves. You know, I mean, you've heard that. I don't need to go over it. But the thing is, could it be that when Jesus comes, if, he had, if we had the chance and we would say, Jesus, well, I didn't know. He, was, he would say, well, didn't you see this? Didn't you see this? Didn't you see this? And, and, and the whole time, it seems like we're waiting for something to happen. 
And all this is happening. In fact, I put on, I put on Facebook when I put his pictures of the, all these fish dying and all these manatees. I'm, 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 I'm telling you, people, there's, there's, there's uh, uh, you, know, you know, they had a line of, of about 100 manatees dead. Okay? They're being poisoned from these waters. And, and then the book of Revelation talks about you know, a third of the fish of the ocean passing away. So I put that and I said, I said, could this be? People say, oh, no, that's not it. That's not it. So we've come to the point that nothing that happens, we are even relating to what Jesus is saying. Nothing anymore. And that's how Lot began to get closer and closer to the cities. Oh, what you going to do? They're, they're, they're born like that. You know, what, what's... And, and the problem that we have, people, we have two problems with sin. One of the problems is that we, we a lot of times, because of sin, we turn against the sinner, and that's not what God wants. And a lot of times we think we love the sinner more than God and we say that it's okay to the sin. In one, we want to be a savior, which is not our job. And in the other one, we want to be a judge. God has not called us to be judges or to be saviors. But he's called us to love people. He's called us to love people no matter what. But he hasn't called us to say that sin is okay, and he hasn't called us to judge people either. When we see this story, if we go to Genesis 18.1, Genesis 18.1, we go there where, where um, we go where, um, the, where the story practically begins where it says then the Lord now uh, this is interesting the interesting about this is that is that the Lord is actually Jesus comes to speak to Abraham it says uh, verse uh, chapter 18 verse 1 then the Lord Yahweh because there the Lord is not just the Lord. The word in Hebrew that is used is Yahweh. So actually God came down to speak to Abraham. Appeared to him by the terebinth trees of uh, Mamre. And he was sitting in the tent during the heat of the day. So he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord. And the word for my Lord is Adonai that he uses. So in both uh, phrases here where it says Lord is using a divine name knowing that this is Jesus. This is God who came down to speak to him. Now the reason why I say Jesus because it seems like through all of the Bible Jesus is the one who has always communicated with man. Amen. And have uh, found favor in your sight do not pass by the serv your, your servant. So, so he, he goes there and these men come and one of them, he refers to, he doesn't say Lord, he refers to one of them and says, Lord. And then he says, my Lord. And he sits down and he invites him into his, his, um, his tent. Now, here it says, in verse 3, and he said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your eye, in your eyes, do not pass on by your servant. Please let, and this is actually interesting. As I was reading this, as I just my parents came to mind. If you came to my house, you were gonna eat. 
If you came to my house with my father there, you were going to eat. It didn't matter if you were hungry or not. That wasn't the question. You were going to eat. And unless you took your plate before he saw it and threw it away, he would fill it up constantly, time after time. He'd be watching you. You'd be halfway through your plate. Boom, hey, you want some more? Here you go. As he's telling you you want some more, he's filling your plate up. Listen to, listen to what, what happens here. My Lord, I have now found favor in your eyes so they may pass over the servant. Verse four, please let a little water. Listen, he tells them, let's have a little bit of water that brought, be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread. In other words, morsel of bread is just like a bite. OK, a morsel of bread that you may refresh your heart after you may pass by. And as much as you have come to your servant, they said, do as you have said. And and actually, Jesus, God, his angels, two of his angels say, go ahead. Now, look at verse six. This part is what reminded me of my dad. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd. I could see him behind the tent, you know, running to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man and hastened to prepare it. He says, why don't you stay by, get a little bit of water, wash your feet and get a little bite. Then he goes, tells his wife, prepare three meals. Then he goes, he grabs, he runs down a calf, kills a calf. So there goes the stuff about Jesus being a vegetarian, all right? <laughs> so, so he goes back there, right? Kills the calf. And he, and he brings it in, right? And, and, and he's over here and he kills it. And he, and he does all these, all these things. And, 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 and this is so uh, uh, just like my dad. You know, anybody come up my dad, all right? Tell my mom, go ahead, get this, get this, get that, you know, whatever, and, and, and get all, all kinds of stuff ready. But when I got, when I got from, from this, I said, you know what? He offered God a little water to wash his feet and a morsel of bread. And God said, yes, I'll take it. It's right. God would take anything from us. That we give him. But then he gave him his best. But then he went all out. He knew who he had before him. And he went all out. And he gave him the best. God will take whatever you give him. But he deserves the best. Yes. And sometimes we are OK. You know, with with God and, 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 and to me, it's 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 why we dress up when we go to church. Is why we try to get the best equipment that we can is why we try to do the things that we can in the best way is why we try to make it as most beautiful as possible we're not trying to impress God we're just trying to give God the best we have yes. You know, and a lot of times, you know, right now there's there's so much issue about people, how they dress to go to. You know what? At Oregon, you can come in shorts and that's OK. Because God will take anything from us and God will accept you. I don't care where you can come here dressed in any in any kind of way. But I have noticed something. That if you were to apply for a job, you won't go in shorts and sandals. Isn't that interesting? Because you want to show your best. OK. And yet now it's come into style because we've made there's nothing holy anymore. Everything is common. And and we made God our buddy. 
we made God our but and we we've, we've lowered God down to our standards. No, Abraham said, I know who I have before me. Amen. He doesn't deserve a morsel of bread. He deserves my best calf. Sarah, come on. Three meals. Three big meals. God is here. God is here. One of the things, people, that we, I don't know, want to do with this sermon, but anyway. Let me tell you, it's getting hard to do church. Because church has become a side thing for people that they do when they don't have anything else to do. But it's hard. It, it gets hard to do church. Because if people have a birthday party, they can't come to church. People got to go to Disney World. No, they can't go Monday because Monday they got to work. But we can miss church. You know, people got to do this. People, you know, it's, it's always like, I don't have anything to do, so I'll go to church. But there, is, there isn't that priority anymore of saying, listen, this is the day I go to meet God. It's not about coming to church. It's not about seeing me preach. It's not about coming. It's a day that we reserve to go worship God. Yeah. And, and the thing is that there isn't that importance in people's mind of saying, listen, that's the day that I've dedicated to God. And what kills me sometimes on these people about these people is, is how people can't miss work. But they can miss meeting with God. When God is the one who provides everything for you. It's like your boss invites you for lunch. He's the one who gives you the job. And you're talking, listen, I can't, I can't, I'm busy. You will never say that. <coughs> you gonna do whatever you gotta do yeah. to go there. But it seems like, you know, people, and we're the ones who, it's like, no, we're not fanatics, you know, we're, we're open-minded now. You know, we're open-minded. And God doesn't deserve my best. He deserves, you know, whenever I'm ready and I'm happy to serve him. But if I have to do anything else, he understands. Abraham said, God is in my house. And it's getting harder and harder to do church. Because even people who lead ministries, even people, it's, it's like people don't take it serious anymore. People don't take it serious anymore. And it gets harder and harder to do ministry because in people's mind, the church it's secular now. It's not holy. It's not ministry anymore. It's just fellowship. And so what if I don't go? But hell if I'm going to miss work. And a lot of times in churches, people might say, well, this ain't going on and this ain't going on. Well, maybe because you're not doing it. We don't see uh, the calling of God to serve him. We don't see going to church as something holy. I don't know if it was the spirit that took over. Or... But. God appeared 
to Abraham and God appeared in many other times. In fact, in Exodus 6, 3, uh, we, we see that God, this was the first time I, I read it and I, and I went and I says, how many times did God uh, appear to Abraham? God actually appeared to Abraham in various times. Now he will come as a human being. He will come in different ways. But God in the Old Testament appeared in many ways. In fact, in Exodus 6, 3, he said, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. He actually appeared to uh, to them. Uh, now, when he he is coming, remember, let's go back to the original story. He's tell, he's coming to tell them about Sodom and Gomorrah. That, hey, he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But what does God do? One thing that I noticed that, there, that, that although he's coming to do this in verse 9, verse 9, chapter 8, verse 9, the Lord asked Abraham something. He says, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. You know, back then they had the tent, they had tents, this big old tent. And really everything was divided up by curtains. It wasn't walls. So Sarah was there. She was listening. He said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your, your wife shall have a son. Remember that God had promised them a son? Remember God promised them a son? I think that by this time they had forgotten about that promise. <laughs> they were so old. I mean, I don't know how many 90-year-olds are thinking about having kids. You know what I mean? <laughs> and in fact, it said that she really, when you first, she wasn't even menstruating anymore. And that even makes it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> And to me, it seems like they had forgotten about that promise. And Jesus said, where's Sarah? He said, you're going to have that son. You're going to have that son. And then there in the story, it says that Sarah did what? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and she could probably count how many reasons why. Not only her, but Abraham too. You know, and she could probably, how many reasons, hey, this ain't going to happen. And the Lord said to Abraham, why is Sarah what? Laughing. Laughing. Now in there it says that she did this in her heart that she didn't laugh out loud. Can you see how God knows what we think? God knows what we think. Now here's the interesting thing to me that I find when I read this, that God doesn't only say, I am going to go destroy, but he is also faithful to his promise. God's plan does not only include the destruction of this world. God's plan also includes the salvation of his people. Amen. And, and do you know what people that sometimes I find that that we sort of forget about that. Amen. And and what's happening that even church has become more of a social need and and church right now is a lot of times fighting with trying to make this place a better place to live than actually preaching that there is a second coming and that Jesus is coming soon and I think that just like Sarah and Abraham who had sort of forgotten the promise I think sometimes we forget the promise too Think about the plans you make. Do your plans involve that Jesus is coming soon? Do your plans involve that? Do, you, do we really preach? Uh, do we preach enough about the second coming? In fact, when I was looking at it, I said to myself, I'm not preaching enough about the second coming of Jesus. 
Because though that is something that was always so alive in our minds since, since little, we, 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 we thought about these things and, and it was constantly in our minds the second of Jesus, it's almost beginning to be an afterthought. God's promise to Abraham had turned into something they had not even talked about anymore. What promises have you given up on? Are there promises that God has given you that you have given up on? Maybe the second coming Maybe finding the man or woman in your life. Maybe a ministry that God put in your heart a long time ago. And right now it's just become an afterthought. Maybe a way that God has asked you to serve him. And now it's just becoming an afterthought. And now you're just sitting on it. It's interesting how sometimes when I get close to you guys and we start talking, you start talking to me about things that God has put in your hearts. It happens all the time. If we actually get together, get one on one, you start talking about things that God has put in your heart that you would like to see. Whatever Jesus has put in your heart, don't let it go. Don't let it go. He can still make it real in your life. And, and, and I want you today to, to take whatever promise uh, he has given you, whatever he has put in your heart, to not let it go, to not let it be an afterthought, to push forward. In verse uh, um, 14, in verse 14, chapter 18, verse 14, it tells us there um, is anything what too hard for the Lord. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And as we look at ourselves, all those promises, all those difficult times that you, you, you see yourself, you almost can reach. I think you should go back to that verse. Genesis 18, 14 is anything too hard for the Lord. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And it's one of the lessons that we, we, we learn here that, that God comes and says, listen, in the process of this world, in the process of going on, do not, do not forget my promises. I mean, come on, really, are angels going to come out of the sky? Really, is Jesus going to come floating out of the, the, I mean, look at the universe. Look at how big it is. Look at how many light years it takes to get to the closest star and forget the furthest star. And look at how, you know, and you can look at all these things and you say, well, how can that even be? Really, are angels going to start popping out of the air? Really, uh, are people going to start coming out of the ground alive? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? You know, is, is my daughter ever going to come to Jesus? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is my son going to be healed? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Can I ever really dedicate myself to serve God? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Can I overcome this disease? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Can I finally overcome my bad attitude? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Can I overcome the sin in my life? The stopping me from really becoming anything that God wants me, everything that God wants me to be, is anything too hard for the Lord? Am I ever going to find that person who I, can, who I can live in happiness with? Is anything 
too hard for the Lord. And we constantly have to keep that in mind. Now, in verse 17, 18, chapter 18, verse 17, God tells Abraham, he says, Abraham, I'm coming to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. In the book of Amos, chapter 7, chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to her servants, the prophets. See, nothing that is going to happen to this world is a secret. You and I know it. God has revealed it to us. In fact, this is why this story is there. We're going to say, oh, this ain't going to happen. Oh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Sodom and Gomorrah. And the thing is that people, we as a church, we as Christians, God has given us special information. Have you ever been at your work and been at places and people are beginning to talk about stuff? And you're like, like, you know stuff. You know stuff they don't. And they begin to talk about the world and the things that are happening. And you're like, should I say it? Should I tell them? Because we have important information that a lot of people don't have. And, and we need to somehow let people know that this world will ultimately be destroyed. And a lot of times I hear a lot of people fighting and arguing politics and going and going at each other, you know, and now it's not just gone. People want to fight now, you know. And, I, and as I'm listening to all this, I'm going, do you not know that there is a God in heaven who's setting everything up perfectly? Perfectly so that he will come and destroy this earth and save those who have picked him as a savior. Do you not know that a leaf doesn't fall from a tree without God giving it permission? Do you not know that when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem three times? And took the, the, the Israelites as slaves to Babylon. Do you not know that God said, I have raised up Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> I raised up Nebuchadnezzar to bring you back to me. While they were praying and saying, this king, this guy has destroyed us, destroyed the temple, destroyed everything, killed them, took slaves back, did all this. God said, I raised up Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. <laughs> That's hard to believe, isn't it? So as we hear everything going on around us, do we... As Christians, do we not know God has revealed to us things? That there is a kingdom of God that we belong to. And the kingdom of God, believe it or not, is having his way. To one day save us. We're not interested in a better world. We are interested in the world that God has for us is eternal life. Now, when we see this story, if we move, in, move on into the story, we know that the Lord stays talking to, Mo, to Abraham. And the angels go off to Sodom. 
They were nowhere Sodom because that's where Lot lived. And the angels get there and, and Lot recognizes, recognizes them. And Lot brings him in uh, to his house, says, listen, you must, you must come to my, to my home. And, and he brings him into his home. And then he also, you know, gives him food. And, and, and they tell him, say, Lot, listen, we're, we're here with a special message. This city is going to be destroyed. Now, as he's telling them this, uh, they, they surround Lot's house. The men, it says the young and old of that city, surround the the house and they knock on the door they're trying to knock the door down and 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 they're telling uh, 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 Sodom listen we know some new guys came into town and 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 we can you bring them out of here because we want to we want to know them <laughs> and when the Bible says you know like in the book of Genesis it says and Adam knew his wife and she had a child <laughs> So they said, we want to know them. Now, so this is Sodom. This is where now we get the, you know, the sin of, you know, sodomy. And we get that from now when you go to the book of Ezekiel, the only that was not the only sin of Sodom. They have many other sins. And, and, and one of the problems that we sometimes have is that we want to make one sin greater than others. And all sins are the same. So, because you, you go, I went through all the verses, Sodom and Gomorrah, sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, and when you go to other verses, especially the book of Ezekiel, it talks about all the sins that they had. And, 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 it, and it talks about all of them, and we have to be careful that we sometimes don't take one sin and exalt it over other sins. And know that we could be as guilty of sins exactly the same. Well, he came out there and he pushed and the angels came and they took Lot and they pulled him into the house because they were ready to kill him. It's interesting that one of the things they said was, look at this guy who came here and has always been acting as a judge over us. You know what I mean? He knew stuff they didn't know. And he was trying to preach. He was trying to tell them, but people, sometimes there, are, there are, are, are places that you and I have to stay up, step away from and stop preaching. Sometimes we make this excuse that we're there because we want to we teach them and really they're the ones teaching you. When people do not listen, when they are not willing to listen to what you're saying, that's what Jesus says, says, do not feed what? Do not put pearls on what? On the swines. And he says, it's time to what? Shake your sh sandals and what? And leave. Lot should have left Sodom a long time ago. You might be in a place that you should have left a long time ago. You might be in a situation that you're trying to force. That you should have left a long time ago. Now, listen to me, young people. Listen to me. Look at what happens. Saul moved, Lot moved into this place. Why am I coming up with all these names except the ones that I need to, you know? <laughs> Sound like my mom, you know, three, three sisters, and before she got the right one, she said the other three, <laughs> you know? But uh, when the angels tell this to Lot, what does Lot do? Lot runs. He, has, he had two sisters that... He had two daughters that were virgins that he offered them up. I, I, I will not, I won't even want to talk about that. <laughs> to me, I have a problem with Abraham and Lot on those issues of offering up their women to other people. I, that is, I don't even want to get into that. That's, you know, like, it, it, but, but then when I was thinking about that also this week, I was like, you know, it, it's, in, it's incredible how we're not all perfect. 
we got issues. And I've always had that with, with Abraham. Bro, how are you going to offer up your wife to somebody else? You know, and, and, and I've always had that, 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 that issue, you know. Uh, but, but anyway, I said, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> nobody's perfect. Because Lot offered up his two daughters to those guys. I couldn't find no theological explanation to make it right. But anyway, but he has two other daughters. But what happened? His two other daughters had married men from Sodom. And when he went to them to say, listen, the angels have come to me and there is a message that we have to leave. The Bible says that they what? They thought that he was what? Joking. Those two daughters burned in Sodom. As we, as parents, as we see our children and we worry about them, who they're going to marry. You, you know, uh, young people here, get off your phones and listen to me. As you're looking at who you are going to marry, there are things that you know today because you've been brought up in a church. That if you marry an unbeliever, they are not going to know. And here's what happens. You have kids and your kids get old. They get older. And you will begin to see around the world the things that the Bible says that are going on. And you're going to one day just wake up and say, wow, it's really happening. And you're going to say, hubby, wifey. We need to get to church. And they're going to say, <laughs> really? Yes. The Bible says this. The, our kids, we want to save them. And he's going to be going for real. Or she's going to be going, really? Come on. How many times has this happened before? And you're going to be going, no. It's real. I remember hearing it in church when I was little. I remember the stories, the Bible, and look, and it's happening just like the Bible says. And they're going to say, really? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Tell me another one. And you're going to see why. Why? The Bible said, what does light have to do with darkness? Why are you going to get together with people who are not with you spiritually? Because when a lot of these things begin to happen, you're going to know them. But they're not. See, like me, as, as a father, uh, you know, my children were all very close to my parents. And... It's like, you know, I watch my kids and I see stuff and, and my thing is, wow. If, if, if they don't live the way they should live, they're not gonna see my parents again. We're not gonna be together as a family again. We're gonna miss out. It, that's why like every step we take in life Every, every serious step that we take in life, we have to see how that's going to affect eternal life. Amen. Because see, we as Christians, we don't see life as ending with death. God doesn't, God's plan for us doesn't stop when we die. God has an eternal plan for his children. So every plan that we make, everything that we do, make sure that you're building on things that are eternal. Amen. Not on things that are just here. 
If you're going to have a wife, is that wife going to be with me forever in heaven? Is that husband going to be with me forever in heaven? I know there's a whole deal people say, in heaven, we're not going to know, we're not going to have husband and wife, whatever. Well, when God created Adam and Eve, he should put them together. Okay? Uh, and it was a perfect world. And it was a perfect world. Okay? Now, well, I can hear it after church now. Okay? Okay? But, uh, be careful. The decisions that you make because when the times get difficult and you have to make decisions based on spirituality and biblical knowledge that you have, make sure you're next to someone who's going to work with you on that. If not, you may be the one at fault for losing your children. You may be the reason why your children don't, won't be saved. He left his children there. Um, and as we look at this story, we know that the angels came and, and took him, his two daughters and his wife, and they led them out. Isn't that interesting how the angels of God walk into a place like that and they grab God's children, God's children by their hands and take them out. And take them out. It is so personal. I mean, that's what God does to us. Amen. He's constantly trying to take us out. He's constantly trying to give us salvation. He's constantly trying to lead us in the right path, in the right way. Angels come and literally take them by their hands and lead them out. Now, we know that Lot's wife, she really didn't want to go. And she loved too much what was back there. And she looked back. And the Bible tells us that she turned into a pillar of salt. In the book, 2 Peter, verse, chapter 2, verse 6 and 9, says, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction. And what does it say? Making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So Sodom and Gomorrah was an example to what? To those who would live what? Ungodly. ungodly. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Yes, God loves us. Yes, he wants to save us. But the Bible also says that God will bring judgment upon the ungodly. And that's the part that Christianity is trying to leave out now. Don't say that to anybody. Don't tell people that they will be burned up and destroyed. That sounds nasty. We're not supposed to tell. But the Bible gives both. 
And the message of Christianity has to be both. God loves you. God wants to save you. He will even send his angels. He will do everything possible to save you. But God will not allow this world to continue the way it is. Ultimately, he will bring destruction upon this world. And if you do not change, if you do not give your hearts to God, you will be destroyed. And maybe you will die before that destruction comes, but your children will. You, you won't have eternal life. God will bring destruction upon the ungodly. But he also brings the promise of salvation to his children. And it tells us, last verse I want to share with you, Luke 17, 28 to 30, of why the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. Now, this is how it's going to be when the end of the world comes. Listen to this, people. See, this is, this is important. You must, this is what the Bible says. Now, as I go back to the beginning. Things are happening. We get used to it. It's nothing big. It doesn't mean that terrible things are not happening. They are happening, but we don't see them as terrible anymore. Okay? We, we become like the frog. Okay? We adapted to them. And that's why Luke 17, 28 says, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built... But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is what? Revealed. Are you waiting for like, like the big one, you know, something like that? No, it, it says that it'll be like you'll be buying and selling and life will be going the same and all this. And it says, and destruction will come. And it says, just as Sodom and Sodom and Gomorrah. See, the angels were there, but those who were blind with their sin did not know it. <laughs> Lot did. And the angels were working. Were they not working? You don't think that God is working now? You don't think that God is putting things in their places? You don't think the angels of the Lord are, are preparing this earth? See, the angels were among them, but they didn't know. And the angels were working things out to save the just. And today God is working to save the just. And God is working according to his promise and his plan to save those who need salvation. If you are blind, you won't see it. But God is working. And just as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, destruction people will come over this earth. I know it's not a popular theme or a popular thing to say today, but destruction will come upon this earth. And we, and we have to, as the children of God, we have to hold on to the promise. Because he also gives us a promise of salvation. Amen. But we have the example that these things are real. That these things are going to happen. Is there anything impossible for God? Is there anything that God cannot do? So today, my church, I want to invite you to have knowledge of these things. That if we're not living right, 
we will be part of that destruction. That we cannot just continue on knowing that we're not right with God. See, when you're in that state, the decisions that you make take you deeper into sin. The decisions that you make are more and more against God. And you're setting yourself up more and more to be part of that destruction. I have to give you that message too. Not just the message Jesus died on the cross for you. As you know that I give that message continuously. But I also have to tell you that judgments are coming into the, over this world. Dear Heavenly Father, as we are here before your presence, we know that you love us. And we know that you have an eternal plan for us. You have salvation for us. But we also know, Lord, that this world will ultimately be destroyed together with those who do not follow you. At some point, you have to keep your promise. At some point, you have to keep the promise of salvation to your children, eternal life in your kingdom. And we ask, Lord, that we each and every day may keep that in mind, knowing that your kingdom is coming. Your kingdom is ready for each one of us. And that only those who really want it will be able to take it, will be able to be part of it. Help us in our lives, Lord, to live accordingly and in the way you want us to. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.